GoGo Van has beaten all other startups in the race to be Hong Kong's first unicorn. Valued at over a billion dollars, GoGo Van has operations all over Southeast Asia and China. 32-year-old Stephen Lam is the man behind the wheel, steering GoGo Van to its current success. But getting here has meant traveling a bumpy road. My high school is kind of like a big problem. I'm definitely one of the worst kids ever here. We have a public exam. I school almost all of it. I skip schools, skip exam, and then I started to hang out with sometimes like the gangster, what we call it here in Hong Kong. And my dad bought me a one-way ticket to California. Without that experience, it won't lead to who, who I am today. It's not because the flight from, from Hong Kong to California, suddenly I want to be a good kid, I want to be a good student now. But I think it's the experience and the environment give me so much pressure that I started to adapt to the, the, the environment that I'm trying to survive. There's no way I got in any good university. So I, I got myself into a community college. At the same time, I work for a Chinese restaurant in the afternoon to make some money. So I think the environment made me to be very, very laser focused on what I need to do at that time. And I end up, my, my academic is picking up and then I'm very focused on making money to make sure I, I don't kick out from, from the school because of just, I just can't pay. In these two locations, I met two great guys. One is Lek and one is Lviv. We went to the same school, we went to the same class together and then we work for the same Chinese restaurant together. We talk about all kinds of things, how to survive. We just need to make money to pay tuition. Now, by working in a Chinese restaurant, just not enough. So it keeps forcing us to think of crazy ideas. So we start off by, by trading bicycle on, on Craigslist, and then we started to buy second-hand car from eBay or Craigslist, and then fix it by watching YouTube. And then we sell it to friends, and I also sold a lot of iPhones, uh, unlocked the iPhone on eBay. That's how I pay off all the tuition in Berkeley. I graduated in 2010, by the end of 2010, and, and I have been uh, trying to interview for many, many companies. But because of the financial crisis, the offer got rejected at the end. So I think, okay, if I'm just wasting time here, you know, just hope for my luck. How about I, 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 I just pack everything and come back to Hong Kong? I spent almost like three to four months to look for a job here in Hong Kong, and no luck at all. After several months, when, they, when we met in Hong Kong again, and then, how about we do something great, uh, crazy again? I told you guys the story that we were working in a Chinese restaurant as a delivery guy. And then at the time, every day, my, our, our job is to deliver a lot of lunch boxes. On top of the box, it said, have a nice day. And then each of the box, when you put it in the plastic bag, it keeps telling you, have a nice day. But I'm a delivery guy, man, so I don't have a nice day. So we, we kind of have an idea, how about we put a sticker? to cover it. And then we said, hey guys, how about we do something similar? Okay, we put advertisement on the takeaway box in Hong Kong. And then within nine months of time, at that time, we grow the company by just distributing several hundreds of boxes every day to over 100,000 boxes per day. And then the biggest problem that we had was logistics. We don't even have the capital to buy our own car to do the delivery or truck. So we call this call center to do the delivery for us, but they never commit they will help you in 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or in, uh, in one hour. And uh, sometimes no driver showing up. And then we started to talk to the drivers and ask if they want to join our networks by using WhatsApp. And then we started to ask the, the drivers, why is that? By calling, there's no drivers responding, but just going on the street, actually like fracking a taxi. Yeah, they are available, what's wrong? And then there's a lot of problems within the industry. They're using radio frequency to co uh, communicate with each other. The radio is not working. Uh, the weather was bad. Things like that. After running that kind of WhatsApp group for drivers for, for three to four months of time, then I decided there's a huge opportunity in there. We assembled the team by the t uh, March in 2013. We only uh, started company registration in June. So we was really kind of playing around until a point that I think we can put it as a company. By the, uh, July 2013, we launched the product. Most of the drivers that we talked to at that time, they thought we were crazy again. Okay, hey kid, you know what, how this job is going to look like? You don't touch your that's a phone, all right? That, that's dangerous. We keep pushing it, but after seven months, we turned the, the drivers that would help us to deliver the lunch boxes, who are kind of test savvy to get on board first. And then they tried it out, and then over the time we registered more and more drivers. That's how we got started. 
we started the whole company with only 20,000 Hong Kong dollars, that's it. So we ran out of money very fast and then we started to look for funding. We got the first funding, 100,000 Hong Kong dollars from Cyberport. That money saved, saved our life. But at the same time, we know it's not going to sustain us for so long. We have to look for other alternatives. And then we start to look for angel investor or VC. We find out if you are a Hong Kong company focused in the Hong Kong market, there's no way you get a penny. I got this question from, from several investors. If you get 100% of the market share, and then each of the citizens or residents here use your service once per year. If that's the case, you make $1 from each of the Hong Kong people per year, it's 7 million Hong Kong. But you are asking me to give you like a 1 million or 2 million US? How's that calculation is going to look like? Okay, so, so with that, it's the limited market size. We don't get a lot of support. But luckily, we got an angel investor. He's a Singaporean. He believes the model is going to work uh, similarly. In, in Singapore. That's why we went to Singapore in uh, 2014, June. Very soon we raised our Series A in Singapore for a focus to expand in Southeast Asia. When I look back, it was not the best, but at that time, it was the right decision for us to go to Singapore. If you ask me again, very soon we should start in China. We thought uh, China is not really foreign company friendly. The way that do business, even open up with business, may be complicated or even risky. So let's uh, focus on what we think we can do the best. So what changed my mind? Money. Uh, by the time we raised Series B, we attracted a very, very interesting investor from China. After running in China for almost three years now, I think uh, we should get into China the, the game much earlier. China is going so fast and, and in terms of policy, business environment is improving a lot. That, that's something that I, I really need to share with everyone. It's not that scary to do business in China anymore. One of the thinking behind or mentality that I got from Berkeley is nothing is impossible, really. But uh, in, in this side of the road, nothing is impossible. It's kind of something people talk about. You see on the book or newspaper, you don't really feel things like that. But when I was in Berkeley, I have classmates we were kind of discussing some ideas, crazy ideas together. This group of people would answer in this way. But that's a stupid idea. But I like it, let's try. So, so that was like, wow. In Hong Kong, it's like, nah, you know, I'm not going to do it. But at the end of the day, if it's really stupid, oh, it's so fun to be stupid. So that's the thing that I guess without that one-way ticket to California, it won't lead to who, who I am today.